Hey folks, David Stewart here. I'd like to talk a little bit today about Tolkien and his works and his life. Um, and one of the themes that's in his work, namely prophecy, it's also a story mechanic that is misunderstood and misinterpreted a lot when his work is being adapted from a book to screen in particular. So adaptations often misunderstand this. And I think it's because the people doing the adapting are not as familiar with Catholic theology and maybe don't come from as strong a Christian background as Tolkien existed in. So again, it's one of those things that if you're not Christian or you weren't coming from that background or you're not familiar with Catholic theology, you're gonna miss one of these themes. That's prophecy. Because what's going on with prophecy, if you pay attention, uh, not just in Lord of the Rings, but again, all of uh, Tolkien's works, you'll notice that it functions in a way that is uh, derived from Catholic theology. And this is the concept of God's permissive will and God's perfect will. You'll notice when characters give a prophecy, it's often conditional. You'll notice also that a lot of the characters who give prophecy are immortal characters. They're Maiar or Valar or elves, or in some cases like Aragorn, who has who is descended from both Maiar and elves. He has that blood in him. He has a certain gift of prophecy that goes along with it. He warns Gandalf. You'll notice the, the prophecies are often very conditional. If you pass the gates of Moria, beware, I say to you, right? So he's giving a prophecy about what's going to happen. Now, the, the simple surface uh, analysis of that is that this is some kind of foreshadowing. And it is mechanically going to act as foreshadowing in a lot of the books. But it's actually referencing a very old and um, often debated part of Catholic theology, which is where our free will works in uh, in the world. Uh, this goes all the way back to like St. Augustine, Boethius uh, dealt with this. If you are a Protestant, you may be more familiar with Calvin. He tends to interact with these ideas more directly. Uh, but the basic idea here is that there's God has a perfect will and a permissive will. A perfect will is he actively wills for something to be done. It's like he pulls the Jews out of Egypt. That's his, his perfect will in action. And then there's a permissive will, which is that people have free will and he allows them to act according to that free will, even if bad things happen. So this is one of the uh, solutions to the problem of evil that I know people who aren't really familiar with theology tend to think is some I don't know, large problem within Christianity, but it's really been dealt with for thousands of years, going all the way back to the Old Testament times. God allows people to do things, to sin, to do things which are bad to others, and that he turns those actions in towards his overall plan. He turns them in towards his own glory. Now, Tolkien expresses this in a metaphorical sense at the beginning of the Silmarillion in what's called the Ayun, uh, what's it? I'm gonna, I'm gonna mispronounce it so I'm gonna read it. Ayunindale, I think, is, is what it is. Or the, uh, uh, yeah, Anulindale. So uh, the music of the Ainur is what that is. That's from somewhere there. Um, what happens is that Iru, God, makes all the angels, the Maiar and the Valar, calls them forward to make music for him. And uh, they make music first alone, and then they start to perceive uh, the nature of the, those that are separate from them and make harmony together. And of course, Melkor, Morgoth, uh, who brings some people over to his side, starts to make music in opposition to the themes of Iru Iluvatar. Um, and then Iru says to Melkor that nothing that you create does not have its uttermost beginning in me, meaning you can't create new things. You think you're creating new things with your rebellion, but you're really just expressing. And everything you do turns back towards my glory, my plan. So it's in the music. This is an example of God's permissive and his uh, perfect will. When you see prophecy in the books, there's a couple things that are going on here. First of all, a Maiar or a Valar, when he gives prophecy, is recalling the music he made before time. And he has some foreknowledge of Eru's plan. He knows the overall plan to some extent, even though because it's part of music, it's veiled to him. He doesn't understand all of it because he has a limited mind, whereas Eru God is unlimited. So by being limited beings, we're not going to fully understand God's plan. It's impossible. That's part of us as humans too. We can't understand all of the plans of the cosmos. It's an impossibility. So God may know every sparrow's fall and how that contributes to his plan, but we are not going to have full knowledge of that. We have to basically we have to trust 
that his plan is going to be enacted because he can turn all of these uh, attempts at rebellion in towards his own glory. So Melkor creates dissonance. What does dissonance create? I'm a musician, so this makes a lot of sense to me. In fact, I love this creation myth for this reason, this mythology he created. Dissonance creates resolution when we resolve to consonants. So we can't fully appreciate the restfulness of the consonants without dissonance that disrupts it. That's part of it. And as uh, as you go further in the Silmarillion, um, you know the Valar are, are are building up the lands. You know they build up symmetrical mountains. Morgoth throws them down so that it that element of chaos, that dissonance, creates all the variety of the world. That's part of what happens. And that is actually part of um, God's design. It's part of his permissive will turning in towards his perfect will. So if you don't know this or you're not familiar with it, you're going to miss some of the things that are happening there. So when a an immortal being, uh, one of the Maiar or the Valar, gives some sort of prophecy, they're recalling some element of the music. You'll also notice that the prophecies are often conditional because they're not going to understand everything that's going on. And especially once we get to men, men specifically have the gift of men, often called the doom of men, which is that they have free will, that they're not bound by the music. They're not bound to the earth. They're, when they die, they're free from the earth and they get to leave it. Uh, they die in truth, whereas elves don't. They go to the halls of Mandos. Uh, they have a completely different uh, concept of what death means uh, compared to a mortal man. Uh, so because men are this unknown, once we get to the actual narrative parts of the book, remember most of, almost all of Tolkien's work occurs after the, the trees of Valinor are destroyed, meaning men have arisen, they arise with the sun, they wake with the sun. So we have, we're, we're operating, all of our stories are operating in the space where there is free will. We have the free will of men disrupting those things. And yet the outcome is almost certain. We could see that, like, why would the ring, uh, in fact, Gandalf says this, you know, it's like you were meant to find the ring, right? And that's an encouraging thought, meaning God's will is acting somehow, and, and that's good. We should trust that, even though it seems so bizarre to us. Like, I don't want the ring. I didn't ask for it. Yeah, but you were chosen to have it for good reason, because you are capable of doing, uh, doing God's will. And when Gandalf gives a prophecy you know, that he like foresees Gollum having something yet to do in the process, you know, for good or ill, meaning Gollum has free will. He can be evil. And in doing evil, what does he do? He destroys the ring. His lust for the ring, even though he could not save himself, he could not turn away from the sin of the ring. If it wasn't for him, the ring wouldn't be destroyed. And in fact, when Gandalf brings the eagles to save um uh, to save Sam and Frodo. He brings three eagles because he doesn't know whether Gollum will be dead or not. He's bringing one to save Gollum. He's bringing one to save Smeagol because he doesn't know what Smeagol will do. Smeagol may have turned away. And if Smeagol had turned away, would they have been able to destroy the ring? We don't know. But um, if it wasn't for him acting out freely his rebellion, uh, his rebellion against God, the plan would not have been fulfilled. Sauron would not have been destroyed. So it's a really interesting way of viewing God's permissive will and God's perfect will that's expressed fully in these books. And you're going to miss it if you're not looking for it and if you're not familiar with these Christian concepts. They're very ancient. Um, like I said, goes all the way back to St. Augustine. Boethius dealt with this kind of stuff. That's um, well over 15 centuries ago at this point. Um, so... If you're not really familiar with those, you're going to miss them. Another really good example is, I think it's Glorfindel that does this. He says that um, the witch king will not be killed by any man. This is when, I think it was the king of Gondor was wanting to pursue the witch king uh, after this battle. And Glorfindel says, no, I perceive that he will not die by the hand of a man. Now, when Glorfindel is giving that prophecy, is he saying that the witch king can't be killed by a man? No, he's not. And this is something that is missed in adaptations. It's like they, they say no man can kill him. Well, Glorfindel just gave a prophecy that no man would kill him. Rather, his end would come from something else. Uh, he couldn't see what exactly, but he knew that a man would not be the one to kill him. Again, he's immortal, but he only he has a narrow view. He doesn't have the complete view. He's giving knowledge of what he's able to perceive. Elrond gives prophecies too. So, of course, who kills him? It's Mary and, of course, 
Eowyn, a woman and a hobbit, neither of them are men. Okay, so he's eventually killed by a hobbit and a woman, neither of which qualifies men, thus fulfilling the prophecy. And Gandalf says this at the end of The Hobbit. He says, come now, Bilbo, you're not, uh, now I'm, I might be misquoting it, so forgive me if the words are slightly off. You're not starting to disbelieve the prophecies just because you had a hand in bringing them about. Because you're just a little fellow in a very wide world after all. And Bilbo says, thank goodness, and hands him the tobacco jar. That's the end of The Hobbit. It ends with this theme, which is this idea of like, don't, you're not going to stop believing in prophecy because you helped bring it about unknowingly. That's God's will turning things in towards the way that they're supposed to be. Remember, the, the, all of history has been already played out in the music, and now they're acting it out. They're acting out the drama of, of, uh, of time in the books, so to speak. So these themes are, are running all the way through every single work that he's done. Whenever you see a character give a prophecy, it's not just foreshadowing. When, when Aragorn tells Gandalf, beware if you pass the gates of Moria, it's not just foreshadowing that Gandalf's going to die or something bad's going to happen to him. Aragorn is actually seeing a strong possibility of that happening, right? He's, he's seeing a glimpse of the future, and Gandalf is not afraid of that, even if he doesn't clearly perceive it. He'd be like, but we, I feel that we need to do this. And it's an essential part of his growth. He has to sacrifice himself for the rest of the party and fight the demon and die and be given a new task by uh, either Eru or the Valar. It's not, uh, you know, it's one hundred percent clear um, to me, at least, you know, which one was doing which, or I may not remember those exact passages. So, you know, you could tell me down below which one it is. But of course, he had to do that. That was like a necessary part of his journey. And Gandalf does not shirk away from destiny when it comes to things like that. He he kind of embraces them um, you know, with two hands. When when uh, Elrond says that, you know, I perceive things ending in a second darkness unless something arises which I can't see. That's really him seeing men. Like there's a possibility that men could save this. Men with their will could could choose the correct thing, even though they don't, even though they're always choosing sin. There's always a possibility of salvation, but I see things ending badly. It's not a. It's always conditional because men are at work and men have free will. So that's the competition between like free will and destiny. It's God's permissive will and God's perfect will, and how He is constantly and subtly like a weaver weaving threads together to make a tapestry. He's constantly bringing those things back in. He's constantly turning everything towards His uh, His eternal plan. Uh, and we see this with the Bible. So the Bible reinforces this. You have many things that happen in the Bible that would be considered bad things. And yet we're constantly reinforced that God is allow either allowing them to happen or is doing them towards his plan and his glory. He hardens the heart of Pharaoh. He allows things to happen which are bad. He uh, he has all of the Israelites carted off into exile. Why Why would he take his chosen people and allow Babylon to cart them all off as captives? And the answer is to make them more pious because they had turned away from him. And it's in Babylon that the Jews really begin to recover their um, their faith, where their faith was very weak, especially from the royal family at the time of conquest, and they had given over to polytheistic idolatry. Then they become more hardened by, by persecution and exile and are able to gain their faith again in preparation for the Messiah, in preparation for Christ coming. All of this stuff is deeply embedded into Christian theology and, and a Christian worldview, and especially a Catholic worldview. And if you're not familiar with it, you're probably gonna miss it. And indeed, most uh, I'd say most adaptations miss the boat on this completely. One more example would, is actually a subtle one, which is that the demon, um, you know, when the Balrog is confronting Gandalf, in the book, Gandalf says, you cannot pass. And in the movie, Gandalf says, you shall not pass. Now, this is a subtle difference, right? It's not a lot. When Gandalf says, you cannot pass, he's speaking the truth. He's not just saying words idly. He's calling down the authority of God when he says, I'm the wielder of the secret flame and all that kind of stuff. You cannot pass. Meaning he's seeing, he basically he's prophesying. He's seeing the future. That Balrog cannot pass over that bridge. It will not happen. He is saying something definitive about the immediate future. He's not saying he's going to stop him. He's not saying, you shall not pass. I will I will stop you. Like, I'm active in it. No, you can't pass. It's an impossibility for you to pass over this bridge. 
um, no matter what happens to him. He knows, you know, he, he has that kind of glimpse of the uncreated light there. He knows what's going to happen to the Balrog. So uh, lots of mo moments like this throughout Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion and all of the other books that you find, Children of Hurin especially. From our two houses, a new star shall arise. Literally a new star arose. It was Arendelle. And new day shall come again, right? Uh, day shall come again. Uh, that I perceive from our two houses. They give Characters give prophecy all the time. Uh, are they merely foreshadowing? No, they're, they're saying that these things are actually going to happen. They are seeing God's plan in action um, as they are talking. So anyway, leaving your thoughts down below with this little... Um, this little bit here and uh, I'll be happy to read them let me know if you think of any other examples because there's so many I'm just really talking off the top of my head but it's something that's deeply embedded in there and it's easy to miss if you're not coming from a worldview that thinks of destiny in this way so thanks so much folks and you've got the little halo around my head Woo. Uh, I'll see you all next time oh wait new books so I got a new book coming out, Al Shafalva. It's a tragic fantasy tale. So if you like the stories from the Silmarillion, you might like that one. Uh, so for pre-order, it comes out in October. Uh, the other one is uh, called Afterglow Generation Y. It's a collection of stories that I've had here on this channel dealing with my generation. It's literary fiction. That's coming out in November. And of course, I have a bi-weekly. It's updating by uh, twice a week, semi-weekly, right? That's right. So I have another story updating semi-weekly on Kindle Vela. If you have Kindle Vela credits or you want to read something on Kindle Vela, it's called Lawless Darkness. Basically, angel, angels versus uh, vampires, which has been fun to write so far. So I'll be finishing that up. And then I will, of course, eventually take it off Vela and put it in a regular book because I know most people don't want to do the whole Vela thing. But I thought I'd give it another shot. I'd give it another shot this year. And Eternal Dream Part 3 is coming later this year. But... Man, we have so many projects to do. It's, it's hard to keep track of all of them. So anyway, leave me your thoughts down below about that theme, and I'll talk to you guys next time.